We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and Emily's back in Argentina. I made it. <laughs> Yeah, for um, for those of you who are not privy to my travel plans, I had about a 30-hour travel day back to Argentina, um, but I'm back now. We're falling victim to poor Wi-Fi once again, so go team. <laughs> it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's going to be great. We're doing it. But yeah, I'm, I'm back um, into winter, so yay seasons it's weird yeah it's it's only almost 100 degrees here in beautiful arizona so yeah i think it's like 60 Yikes. degrees 18 degrees celsius something like that i don't know Ugh. um but no i'm i'm excited to be back now that the asia races are done because yeah. the asia race timing in argentina is miserable worse than in the u.s so now you know when we kind of get into our european races i have great race time okay. So, yeah, I will. I will say to just like start diving into China. I, I, I really was surprised at how much I liked the track itself. Like I, I really like that track. The race weekend, on the other hand, reminded me a lot of Baku last season. Agreed. Yeah, it really was giving Baku vibes. Um, But no, I really like the track. And I think I sent this to you on Instagram. And I mean, it was on Instagram, but um, it's wild to see. Yes. Shanghai skyline has changed over um over the years I mean we have like we've been saying until the cows come home uh we haven't raced in China in a very long time since 2019 um, because of the pandemic and their restrictions in in China and you can see so much change from you know early on in the 2000s or before 2019 2019 and uh 2024 um so it was really interesting yeah, it to was, see that. Yeah, that was really in the background. fascinating. They, you know, China has spent so much money, you know, investing in infrastructure over the years, but like to actually have that side by side was really, really cool. Yeah, no, it was. Uh, well, before we get into the race itself, I kind of want to highlight some like off track things. So, first of all, we know that Catherine and I love helmets. We had some come out before we recorded for China, um, but Botas also had a dragon helmet that was dropped, you know, much closer to the race time, so we didn't catch it in our preview episode. I really like this one. This is like the dragon helmet of my dreams versus George's like typical meh helmet. I liked it. What did you think? Did you like it? Yeah. I, I really liked it too. It, I hundred percent agree. Like when I first saw it, it was like, that's the yep. dragon helmet George wanted. Um, so it, it was, it was, it was really cool. It was unfortunate that Botas's car decided that it could only do one race <laughs> in a weekend instead of two. Um, but you know, cause, cause you know, all things considered and we'll get into it, but Sauber didn't have an no. awful weekend yeah. until that DNF. No, they were actually doing decent. For once, finally. They're yeah. figuring out that wheel nut. I know. I, I feel like that's the joke, the butt of every joke this season is just Sauber's wheel nut, but, you know, they'll get there eventually. Yeah, um, pretty much. Another thing I want to talk about, mostly because my dad even called this out when we were watching, um, Nico Rosberg's commentary. <laughs> just period. Um, yeah. We were watching it, and my dad was like, does this guy hate Lewis or something? And again, my dad is not, like, super – Privy the answer is yes. One and the drums between the two as teammates. Um, but he's like, man, this guy's brutal. And I'm like, yeah, he is. So I feel like Lewis had to have had like, or not Lewis, Nico had to have had a sign next to him or somewhere in that commentary box um, that said "Bean Bounce," and that he kept forgetting that because he like he would say something mean and then immediately like two seconds later be like, "Oh, I have to say something nice about Lewis again." Um, and I just it was as as somebody who's not a big fan of Lewis and who like is very entertained by the um, Hamilton Rosberg rivalry, it entertains me. But I know that a lot of other people like. It wasn't Martin Brundle, and we want Martin back. I mean, 
you could throw anyone on there though, and I would still prefer Martin because I just I love him. So, but I, yeah. I think it was just a lot of. I mean, obviously they're there to co- you know commentate and give opinion, but I feel like some of his opinions were just <laughs> way. <laughs> you know, skewed towards negativity towards Lewis, which is fine. I mean, it is what it is, but um, I don't know. I And I'm, you know, in the same camp as Catherine of it is funny and it is entertaining, but only in certain pockets, not for a full weekend. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting that he, he got a lot of credit for, you know, being in commentary as a more current recently retired formula one driver because you know he retired after the 2016 season um and that gives a lot of insights that the likes of you know uh, martin and um jensen button and Karun shandok who only raced for a good five seconds um that they don't have in this you know current time um that I that I I don't necessarily know how relevant it is, especially because we're so far away from the regulations that Rosberg drove under. No, I I could not agree with you more. But that said, you know, it was really funny that he just like he would say something mean about Lewis and then be like, oh, I have to be nice again. Yep, yep. love it. Yeah, but no, yeah, it was interesting that because that's kind of the. F- is it one of the first times we've had him as a main commentator for the whole weekend? Because normally he just kind of does side stuff, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Th- this is the, the first time that we've we've had, you know, n- you know, he he's done a full one. I don't know if, you know, he's done it in the past. You know, there I, I didn't pay as close attention to the Sky Commentators, you know, 2021-ish era. Um, so I I think that this was like his first weekend really doing like the color with Crofty. Um and it was it was it was fine. I mean, the he he is Nico Rosberg is higher on the list of people that I would prefer to team up with Crofty. Um, if we can't have Martin, um, so it, it wasn't terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. Another thing, kind of track related, but off track, is that it kept catching on fire. <laughs> How does that happen? I was seeing so many things on social media of like, no, but someone tell me what happened. Like, who started the fire? <laughs> what happened? How is this happening? Um, wild. I mean, the answer is sparks from car plus dry grass equals flame. But like, that's like grass is next to everywhere. So the, and like the fact that it just kept catching fire, it's like, what? <laughs> what yeah wild wild and like yeah like you said it there's grass at a ton of you know tracks and it I mean I don't know it just is yeah it it was just like it's something that you don't expect to see and then definitely something you don't expect to see twice and then it rained and it was it was fine but yeah it was somebody's car threw up some sparks and grass go whoosh and the fire spread for the the, the first wish. the first one. That fire spread very quickly because like the camera was on like and it was like this little patch of grass and then all of a sudden it pulls back. And you're like, oh, that's a lot of grass that's actually on fire. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, what a what a weekend. Who saw that coming? Certainly not us. Wasn't wasn't in our. Uh... On our bingo card. Speaking of, yeah, yeah, we, I, we, uh, I got I got We got to take a look at the the. We're fine. Yeah, we. I'll, I'll I'll do that this week. TBD. Uh, we can address it in our uh, our next. Yeah, yeah. Week. We um uh, yeah. We'll um, or we'll say something if if there's anything that's been crossed off. We'll we'll post it on our Instagram account at going dot off dot track. Um, something else, kind of track related ish. Not, you know, whatever. Um, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> words, Emily. Words. Jet lag. Um, Haas and Alpine brought upgrades, which, you know, yay, let's be competitive. I think it, it um, helped a little bit. Obviously, you know, Nico Hulkenberg for Haas is the, the most notable as he did score a point again in the Grand Prix. He had a steering wheel issue in the sprint, um, but overall he took advantage and had a pretty decent weekend. Yeah, no, I thought Hulk looked good. But then again, I feel like Hulk is always there, like, right on the yeah. border. Yeah, it's either so. he's right on the border or he gets incredibly unlucky. Exactly, exactly. And then, 
Alpine's upgrade was only for Acon, so Gasly did not get them. But they had a fine. They both weekend. qualified in Q two for the Grand Prix for the first time this season. I mean, Acon's made it out once at, out of Q one, and and Gasly joined him for the first time. Um, so it it was you know obviously Alpine's not where they want to be. I don't think they're gonna get remotely to where they they expect to be this season, but they are improving, and that's what you expect out of all of the Formula mm-hmm. One cars. But my real question is what the hell is with this Alpine Ferrari red merch? I, it's so dumb. I was very confused for a minute when they posted those pictures on social media. I'm like, why is Gasly in red? Wildly confused. I just, I just wanted to ask that. No, it's, I, I don't have an answer for you. Someone was taking a lot of creative liberty and. I I don't Like their colors are blue and pink. With all of these. I know, with all of these, and black, <laughs> can't forget the black, but with all of these design decisions and merchandise decisions that come out, you know that they have to go through so many levels of approvals and okays, so that means there were multiple people who thought, yeah. yes, we are Alpine, making Ferrari red merchandise makes sense. How? Like, this is what this is the piece that I don't understand. Right? Like, you're not going to get Ferrari red merchandise out of Red Bull. And, like, you know, we, we talked in the, the livery episode about, you know, how, you know, we like Alpine's, you know, colors in general and the merch that they released when they, you know, announced the car was was pretty, you know, it was, it was good. Um, but this red is just, that's going off track. Way, way yeah. off track. But anyway, to to more important things looking toward the future where yeah, let's so let's talk about 25, 25 again because it's not like we don't talk about 2025 every single week. Um this came out basically right around race start, which for me was midnight, for you was 2 a.m. Um where apparently the F1 teams are considering a change in the points allocation starting next season where instead yep. of point scoring positions being p1 through 10 they are now going to they're they're potentially going to be p1 through 12 where p1 through 7 would stay the same you would get the same amount of points for each position um but then p8 on down would change so p8 would go to five points from four p9 would go four points from two p10 would get three points which is the same that we give out when we're doing our p10 predictions from one point um and then p11 would get two points and then p12 would be the last points place with one point um what do you think about it emily i love it um i wish they would do points all the way to p20 i mean as long as you finish the race like if you dnf i don't think you should be awarded points um i just think that we i mean if you look at every race that we've had so far this year the really good fights have been between like p10 to p15 right right and as long as someone is you know, racing, I feel like they should get a point. Not because everyone deserves a participation ribbon, but if you're in P16 and you know you can't get to P10, what's your motivation and, like, what's driving you to place higher or to keep overtaking or to keep pushing it? Or are you just trying to finish the race because, you know, to finish the race? I think if every single position gets a point – It becomes much more competitive, not just necessarily for podium, like P1 to P3 or trying to get that last point at P10. But I think overall, the whole grid gets more competitive. But also, and I think this is a point that you've raised and I'll let you talk to it. But I think it does open the doors for more teams to come to the grid. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I I think that this is kind of a a signal of, you know, in in our uh, predictions episode, we talked about, you know, the concern of, you know, corporate greed of sorts, if Formula One in the next Concord agreement decides that they want to limit the grid to only 10 teams, and that the only way to get a new entrant would be to buy out an existing team, um, which I think that if you expand the points offerings, then that is another, you know, 
moot, you know, that, that remove the, the, you know, perceived issues that the teams are saying like, oh, we can't have a, you know, another, another team because of, you know, insert list here. Um, so I, I do think that I, I think it's good. I, I was, I was asked my opinions on this at first, right after the news came out when they were talking about it during the race. And I was like, it's after midnight. I have no thoughts. I'm just trying to stay awake. Um, but my thoughts are, I like it. Um, I don't think I it, it I don't think it would hurt. Um, and to to your case, and and Crofty also brought this up on the broadcast of should there be points for every finishing position on the grid? I say yes, with the caveat, like you said, of if drivers don't finish, they don't get points because you have that kind of gray area where a driver, if they um, finish you know, 75% of the race, they'll get classified. I think if you don't finish, you can still be classified, but you should not get those points unless you actually cross the finish line and under the checkered flag. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And I can, I can see that I, being the direction that, that Formula One goes. Yeah. Cause I just don't think, well, what I don't think you should get a point for not finishing. Um, I think you only get, you know, credit if, you finish but I I truly believe that it would make the whole field more competitive because right now it's really you know you have Red Bull Aston Martin um Mercedes ish and McLaren like those team and McLaren thank you so that's half the field are really the only ones that we continuously talk about in a positive light we will talk about Alpine in a negative way all day long um and then we forget you know, that Sauer's there unless they're having pit stop issues. Their wheel nut is, you know, struggling. But I think if you award points everywhere, that makes it much more competitive. And then it also will help with the standings. Because if you have multiple teams that continuously don't get points, but they're P11, P12 every single race, like they should be considered above the teams who are continuously P19 and P20. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, it it would, you know, Logan Sargent finishing P20 every race, that's four point. you know, for let's say four races, that's four points. That's not going to get him high in the standings, um, but at least he would have points instead of not having points at all. Um, so I, I think that it would... S- well, I mean, it's still not going to look great, he, but it's better than nothing. No. And it's better than like get into I the agree. points, you know, got to get into the points in this pressure to, you know, get all the way up to P10. Um, it, it's a lot for some of these cars that are not performing as well compared to the top half of the grid. Yeah, I really I think it helps like the underdogs and the both constructors and drivers, because I mean, there are some drivers who've been P11 to P13 almost every single race. So it looks like they're at the same level as Logan Sargent, but they're driving better than Logan Sargent. So, you know, having the points expand to more positions, I help, I think really helps, you know, show the true um, ranking of the drivers. Well, I think, well, I, I think you know, it remains to be seen. I, I think that generally it's been a pretty popular um idea since it's been announced i haven't seen a lot of you know detraction about it on social media um so we shall see once they make a decision and announce it and then we can talk about it you know further yep i'm excited to see where this one goes um but with that i think that covers all of my off track items. yes we can uh, yes. get into China. Um, Starting yes, with was. the... We survived so this our first sprint weekend. weekend. Let's start with the sort sprint. Of. Um, we, we sure did. We did survive. Um, I, I'm not quite ready to say I don't hate sprints, but I will publicly say that this sprint was not horrible. Yeah, I'm I'm also not not ready to say that we were wrong about the format cuz I don't think we are. Oh um, no, 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 no. We're not wrong. We're very right on the format. Um and and I think that sprint weekends in general don't you know lead to better race weekends. Um that said, I'm really glad that they fixed the park Fermi rules for sprint rate weekends. Oh my gosh, because I originally know. you're you have one hour of practice and to pump the or the sprint and park Fermi, for those of you who don't know, is when you're not, you know, you you set up the car the way that you intend to for the race and you're not allowed to make any major set of changes. And so, um, so prior to the season, your park Fermi 
your your setup choices go into park ferme going into the sprint qualifying and stay through the end of the grand prix race on sunday now you have two different um park ferme periods you have one at the beginning of sprint qualifying that ends after the sprint race and then it the second one begins at the beginning of regular qualifying and ends after the grand prix and i think that is a massively important improvement yeah because last year it sucked it was terrible and every single sprint weekend people were starting from the pit lane right exactly um but that said i think the only reason why this sprint race itself was exciting this this time was because it rained in q3 in the sprint qualifying which led to a little bit of a mix-up in the grid um but then you know after max got to the front he blew by Lewis and was up by 13 seconds after like nine laps. That's the thing too, is like he won by 13 seconds in a sprint. In a 19 lap <laughs> race. Only 19 laps? Oh, I, yeah. you know, I'm just, he is very, very good. And I just, I really like too how, I feel like he's kind of the jokic of F1. Like this is his job. It's not his whole life. He does a lot of other things. He really could care less. Like, yes, he wants to win, but he's like, meh, meh, meh. When I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, he's he's very. Yeah, when I'm like, done, I'm done. It is what it is. Like it's he was job. trying to drift on the last lap of the Grand Prix. Oh my god, I know. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, so from that aspect, I can kind of you know appreciate him, and I know he's very good. But no, I think I think it really was interesting to have a super mixed up grid. Um, which goes to show like the reverse grid that everybody has talked about for sprints would be great um would be great and more entertaining so that made me really think that about that possibility more just with this mixed up grid um but yeah the the weather definitely played a factor yeah it it, it did and I I think that a lot of you know I I don't think anybody uh expected Max to be that bad in the rain and I know that and not to like justify Max's poor qualifying in the sprint, but the um, basically they coated the the track surface going into this race because it hadn't been raced on. So that definitely threw a wrench in a lot of the other, you know, most of the team's, you know, plans on how, how that track was going to, you know, handle the cars and obviously there was no grip, not even on those inters for a lot of people, even Lando who ended up getting pole reinstated um and then lewis i i think you know lewis is obviously a very talented driver in you know any condition um but he got a little lucky that qualifying worked out the way it did for him in the sprint oh for sure yeah so speaking of that coding because everyone was expecting them to resurface the track because it hadn't been used in so long but they didn't resurface it yeah I, could that. Um, I, I i think that the teams all of the drivers pretty much got it got a decent handle on it you know, pretty well. Um, and it's just, they, they didn't expect the rain um, to to do what the rain did with, with it within, in that session. But I, I think that I'm glad that it didn't continue to rain throughout the rest of the weekend because I, I think that it would have caused a lot more problems. And we had enough problems in that Grand Prix that we didn't need any more right. related to the weather. The things I just want to talk about on the sprint before we move on, because I, I hate the sprint, but it wasn't horrible. Um, Lando completely blew the first corner. Just, it was just, or it just the start. Like it was, I was so excited for Lando. I was like, this is his opportunity to like make something of his name and stop landing on podiums and not winning. And then they started and nope. I'm like, <laughs> well, nope, that, nope. Well, as, as as soon as he, he had that wheel spin on to get off the line for the formation lap, it was like, oh, I'm nervous. <laughs> and I was right to be. Um, and, and I think Lando was so focused on trying to hold on to P1 when he was battling with Lewis in those yeah. first couple of turns um, that he, he, he should have backed off and then tried to overtake because that McLaren at this point is a lot faster and he would have been able to overtake Lewis again. No, I completely agree. Um, speaking of overtaking, the like Fernando, Carlos, Perez, Charles of it all. Battle. The, the, the train. The, the train um, that was. And then, you know, the one corner where Perez got in front of both of them. I was just, like, pissed. I was like, God Yeah, that, that doubles. I, 
I didn't expect him of all of the drivers to, you know, take the to be able to take the most advantage out of um, that whole train and that that fight between Carlos and Fernando Um, gutted for Fernando with that that puncture when he when he hit Carlos because Fernando had been driving so he had like, like he salvaged what he could out of this weekend. Um, he got some penalty points onto his license, what I've talked about before about how that really doesn't matter. And so it's completely irrelevant, whatever. Um, but yeah, for the God, Fernando, like he was almost there. I know. I mean, as much as we all know that I don't like Checo, I think he did take a real, take really good advantage in that corner when they were fighting um it was a really good move which Great isn't something that move. he necessarily would have done um last season right yep I think he's feeling a little bit more comfortable he's getting his confidence back a little bit but he was driving really well in the beginning of last season too you have to remember that like he won right right yeah a few races last season so we'll see where the rest of his season goes but no he he was a uh, pretty good this weekend um but you know, we also still have the Ferraris fighting, and I feel like... I'm a little concerned about I, them. That was not a good weekend for either of no, them. No, it was not. I was honestly really upset. Um, I think... I think that Charles is starting to get his panties in a bunch that Carlos is driving mm-hmm. better than him, and Carlos is still on team, like, Carlos, and I'm not listening to team orders. Um I just don't know how that's going to affect like the atmosphere at Ferrari. I think things are, are pretty rocky. They've said that everything's fine and they get along and whatever, but I don't believe it for a second. Um, I think it's going to be this Ferrari is its own downfall. Yes. And I think we could see a lot of rocky races from those two this season. Yeah. I, I think Fred Vasseur is going to have a lot of problems if those two are driving next to each other. Um, at any point throughout the yeah. season. And that really, um, they, they really showed that in this race, obviously in Australia, um, Carlos was just leagues ahead of Charles and Charles was ahead of Carlos this weekend. And you kind of called it um, in our predictions episode that, that uh, Carlos struggles in the sprint weekends. Um, he does. So, so it was, it was just, it just not a good look for, for Ferrari. Like this is something that you expect out of the Alpine boys. Um, and this it's, um, I think this is a little, little bit of a red flag, so to speak. No, definitely. Oh, but anyways, it was, it was overall not the worst experience in a sprint. Yeah, the the problem with these sprint weekends is you get one or the other. Either the sprint is a downer and the race is decent, or the sprint is 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 good and the race is a a, a bummer. And like this this race was, you know, Max went off the line and said bye, and he was gone. Um, and like in to to enter into the Max Verstappen record book portion of this episode. I was just gonna say, are we st- are we starting our uh, our Max portion of the episode? Yeah, let's do it. He um he helped happened. Red Bull to their hundredth career pole. First one was also in China. I think that was technically on. Um, nope, nope, he did not get poll for the sprint uh that so the the regular poll this is their hundredth career poll position the first of which was also in china which is cool but he won both the sprint race and the race race by 13 seconds um he's the first driver with five consecutive poll positions to start a season since mika hakkinen in 1999 and not only has he won in china for the first time but this is his 26th different circuit win and max has now won 50 percent of all of formula one's races since the last chinese grand Prix in uh, 2019 there have been 106 races since then and he's won 53 of them can we be done now uh yeah i'm done <laughs> um but he still does not have the elusive singapore no victory it'll so. it'll we'll, we'll we'll see if he gets singapore this year i think singapore might just be his albatross forever um but it's 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 max did max things uh i was a little worried for about three seconds when he didn't qualify well in the sprint and then i was like wait this is baxter staff and never mind it'll be fine and it was as a red bull fan i i just like really just for for shits and gigs i want to see max start p20 and see how far up the grid he can he can go i mean if you're putting a brand new engine in the back of a car then i can totally i mean lewis has done it plenty of times um so 
Yeah, I don't think it's entirely unreasonable. I want to. I think he's done it before. I, I, I don't. I, I gotta look up like Max's, you know, highest. I think P fourteen. I think it's fourteen. Was his lowest? Was like his lowest start to win a, yeah, a GP? Yeah, probably something like that. We'll have to fact check that. But um, so Max did Max Tings and was you know great. Go go Max. Um, but Lando had a pretty good race after you know missing a, the mark and yeah thing. yeah he um you know he redeemed himself i think he got a little bit of help red bull um red bull had two flawless double stack pit stops um in in the grand prix um oh god but i the second one um during during the the safety car period um i think they really mistimed it a little bit for perez um, and I think that gave Orlando a little bit more of an advantage. Um, but the McLaren was surprisingly pacey all weekend. Um, he was on a really fast lap in, I think, free practice that was that he ba- that he bailed on, but he was going purple sectors all the way down, and it probably would have been the fastest by a lot. Um, and the fact that Lance Stroll led qualify led led uh the first practice session was just like interesting well no, he, he did not and then Paris had weekend, had a good weekend too um, he, he got a, a couple you know podiums uh out of out of the deal um he he didn't look as good in the grand prix itself that, than he did um in the sprint but that's that's what you want out of your number two red bull drivers is what Perez did except you know maybe p2s instead of p1 or p3s yeah i mean i think checo's very much on the track to get his seat again with to renew yeah. his seat with Red Bull. Um I think he's driving how they want their number 2 driver to drive. He's meeting those expectations and I think unfortunately as much as I would don't want him to get that seat cuz I don't want him on the grid anymore <laughs> because I don't like Checo. Um I think he'll end up at Red Bull for 2025. Yeah, I just think, I think that I think he's doing what he needs to. I know we're only five races in, but yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it, it's early, but with what we've been hearing about Carlos Sainz and the the deal that has been presented to him potentially by Audi, Red Bull is basically saying like we can't give him the money that Audi wants to give give him is allegedly what the situation is. Um, you know, C- Christian Horner v. Helmet Marco have said a couple of like varyingly different things, um, but I think that if Carlos doesn't pick Red Bull, Checo will stay. Yeah, but okay, let's go off track here for a second. Because if you're Carlos and you have two offers on the table, one is for a lot of money with a new team with maybe not the greatest car, do you take that or do you take less money to be on a winning team and win and be super competitive and have a chance to like truly show if you're a better driver than Max? If you're in equal equipment against Max Verstappen, like that's to me sounds more exciting than more money at Sauber yeah you know well I mean? the thing about it is is Sauber will be you know Mahula you know in in 2026 and the real question is is Audi confident enough in their potential for Carlos to choose that route than playing second fiddle to Max Verstappen yeah but I don't know if he would play second fiddle to Max I mean yes because Max is their golden child but I think I said this in another episode I think you put Carlos in Checo's car and it's going to be a lot closer than what Checo's doing right now so I think there's more potential for him to be you know a lot more competitive and maybe take races away from Max in the same car with the Ferrari he can't do it but the same car I think he could right so then do you think that the statements that we're getting out of Red Bull about how they can't afford Carlos versus, you know, the, the Audi deal, is that real or are they obfuscating and they've really got something in their back pocket? Honestly, I don't know. I would like to, I would like to think that they're being truthful. I think Audi coming to the grid as a new team, they have to throw a lot of money at whoever. Carlos mm-hmm. is one of the better drivers without a contract right now. So I think it makes sense that they would throw a lot of money at him. But I think they also have to back it up, like you said, with the confidence that they're going to be competitive. Because, I mean, if if you just think about it, these are, there are only 20 drivers in the world who do this. They have an extreme competitive drive. They want to be the best. So if someone offers you 20, 
throwing out numbers, $20 million to drive for, you know, Sauber right now in this year, $20 million to drive for Alpine, $20 million to drive for Alpine, $2 million to drive for Red Bull. I think they would take Red Bull over the $20 million. Why would you want to, you know, not be competitive, not be able to succeed and try to win races just for, I mean, I know it's money, but at the same time, it's like, you're a competitive athlete. You're in this to win, to be the best. Why wouldn't you choose the better team? Yeah, the the question here is really the the kind of the five year plan aspect of of these teams because these teams they they're they're going into the thinking of now, but also you know five six seven years down the line, and you know obviously Carlos is you know still very young, but he is an older driver, um, so it it's really you know the other question is you know where's the best chance to win a championship, and you're not going to win a championship behind Max Verstappen. And this is as saying as I, while saying that I would love to see him in the Red Bull, but he also wants to win a championship. And could he get that from Audi? I don't, oh, I don't think he could get it from Audi, but you also, I mean, Carlos Sr. is still doing rally, which is absolutely insane. So maybe. And Carlos Fernando said, is going to be driving until the cows come home. So maybe, you know, he's just following his country in his countryman's footsteps and thinking he's going to be around for a long time. We all know Max Verstappen is done at the end of his contract because he he's over it. So maybe probably, he puts it, well, who knows, but so maybe he's just putting in the time now. I don't know. We have to talk seats. We really have to talk seats because you and I can yeah, talk we, about this for hours. Yes. Let's get back to China. We will table the, the discussion of, of seats. Um, let's talk about Joe Guan Yu real quick. Obviously he didn't have a great Grand Prix race, but he had a great sprint portion of the weekend. He did, and he made it to Q3, and also, like, I got super emo watching him at the end of the race crying with the fans, like, cheering for him, and I get chills just thinking about it. Like, I was so happy for him. Yeah, I I love that they did that for him. I think, you know, obviously lots of drivers on the grid have home races. Um and the the podium finishers, they 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 parked um on on the grid at the end of the race. Lando forgot and went into the pit anyway, but um but they also had a parking spot for Joe Guan Yu as the home driver. I thought it was really special. I thought it was really nice that they did it. I don't expect to see that at other home races. Um, but this is the first Chinese driver in, you know, driving in a, a Chinese Grand Prix. So I thought it was incredibly appropriate to do that. They love him so much there. Um, it was incredibly meaningful. And I thought it was a great thing to to be able to have him, you know, salute the crowd at the end, end of the race in front of them instead of having to come out from the pit lane. No, I think it was so cool. And I still I have chills just thinking about it. You do too. Um, it's such a big deal for them to have you know, a Chinese driver at a Chinese Grand Prix for the first time, which again goes back to my argument that he will not be leaving the grid. Yeah, I I actually do have some thoughts about that, but we'll table that for when we're discussing seats. Um, I I do have, I I have some, I have some thoughts about that. I also really do hope this means we get to see him at another Chinese Grand Prix because that was just such a cool experience this weekend to to have him there and to see him driving in front of his home crowd. Um, But I hope we do get to see that again. Let's talk about Danny Ricardo. Yes, let's talk about Danny. Yeah. Um, so he he came to China with a new chassis after kind of campaigning for a new one from from the team. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. He you know, he he felt that some of the issues he was having with the car were related to the chassis. But then Alan Permain, who's RB's racing director, said that the chassis doesn't have anything to do with the performance. But clearly it has something to do because Daniel looked really good this weekend. Um, he did. He, and I mean, like, not like great, um, and not where we want Danny to be, but in comparison to the first four races, this was a really positive step. Um, and I really don't think that he just looked good in comparison to the fact that Yuki looked so bad this weekend. No, I think, I mean, if we, if we take every individual performance of Danny so far through five races, this was, I think he looked the best this weekend. 
yeah, he 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 did, and I you know it's it's and I don't think it's also a Danny has experience on this track and Yuki doesn't because Yuki is one of the four drivers who's never never driven on this track before. Um, but I I thought that you know whether it was a placebo effect, um, but I I don't think it would have been a placebo effect because you know. Danny is such a much better driver than he's shown this season um, yeah. that I, I really do think that whatever they did with this new chassis um, helped. Um, and I, I don't necessarily know if he would have finished in the points or very close to it. I think based on the safety car situation, he had a really good chance to finish in, you know, P10, P11. Oh my God, Lance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was bad. Oh, I just, I loved all the, like, yes, we can talk about everything, but I just loved all of the social media commentary around Lance Stroll this weekend. It was so good. Yeah, he he re- rear-ended Daniel right before the race start and didn't think that Lando needed his or that that Daniel needed his diffuser, um, and then and and Daniel was pissed. Oh, pissed. Um, and and Lance is like, "Why he he brake checked me?" And we're like, "No, you rammed into him." Yeah, not good. Not good. Yeah, and then team principal Mike Crack doubled down today. Um, today is Monday as we record. Um, criticizing the penalty and being like, "Oh, it was given too quickly. We didn't have an opportunity to respond." I'm like. Yeah, because he hit him. It was clear. I just love how yeah. like they can try to justify that it wasn't his fault. Yeah, it's like it was a Constantina effect. Everybody was 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 stopping, and Oscar Piastri, who was in front of Daniel, was like, "Yeah, but nobody else crashed." Oscar's commentary and Oscar struggled too. Is getting so good. I love him. I love it. <laughs> He he's growing so much, he's so comfortable with like the sass and the the jokes. He's no longer like the, the scared little rookie anymore. Not that he ever was last year, um, but he yeah that was that was great. But you know what? Should Lance's seat be at risk based off his performances so far this season? Because he hasn't looked good. Honestly, if you take a look at last season, even Fernando was killing it, and Lance was barely getting into Q two. And I just I don't think. I don't think he's that good. I think he's really there because of his dad, um, which is fine. You know, we love a Nepo baby. But I just think they should look at other options and they should consider other drivers. He just doesn't seem like he's that in I agree. there. I don't know. But I, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the betterment of the team and for them to progress, I think they need to invest in another driver. I, I agree. Yeah, I, I think that if, you know, if this was any other driver, there would be a ton more speculation about his his performance so far. And obviously, you know, the, you know, the team is being asked about the status of Lance's contract based on Fernando's extension. Um, but they're kind of, you know, demurring about that because it's all daddy's decision, really. Um, but I, I, I think that he should it should be a little bit more precarious, even with his, you know, unlimited whatever contract that he's got. Um, yeah. But also Aston Martin's Grand Prix strategy with Fernando, really quick, not my nope. favorite. That that was he should not have put on those softs. Um, one last thing that was a little disappointing this weekend. Um, let's talk about race control. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not not great. Yeah, and and like it took forever for them to deploy the VSC, and then you then even longer to turn it into a real safety car after Botas's engine crapped out on itself. Um, but you know he pulled off to a safe safe place, but he was still on the track technically. Like he he was still in a danger zone based on where the breaking points were, um, and the fact that they didn't that they waited so long to to deploy the the virtual safety car was like. Why are you doing that? And it took even longer to, you know, clear the track. Obviously, his car got stuck in gear, which is very tricky to move a car when it's in that situation. And you saw all of the marshals trying to push the car to, you know, get it. It's like, how many marshals does it take to move Botas's car off the track? So many. More than I thought. (laughs) Um, But it it took, like, that the entire VSC safety car period, I think, was just managed really badly. And 
was a really obviously a safety car portion is never going to be an exciting portion of a race but i think that they could that they could and should have managed that a lot better and then of course we had another safety car after stroll did stroll things and there was debris to clean up but it also took forever to clean up the debris yeah maybe they're just you know getting back into the swing of things clearly have a had a had a you know chinese grand prix in five years give them a give them a little bit of a break yeah I guess. <laughs> uh, well, anyways, let's get jump into um, the final part of our podcast for a recap, which is going through our China Grand Prix predictions. Uh, we did not do great this weekend at all. Not the best. Um, not the best. So for the sprint poll, it was Lando. We both picked Max. We both missed on that mark. The yep. podium for sprint was Max. Louis Checo would no. have, you know, thought that in a million years. Uh, you had Max Checo Carlos. I had Max Checo Lando. So, you know. And then George got P8 for the sprint, which is the last position in sprint races where you earn a point. Catherine picked Botas. I picked Stroll. Yeah. Um, I want to add that. really quick um, that in, in talking about expanding the points positions, I also think that they should expand the points positions for the sprint. I don't, I think it should at minimum go down to P10. I don't like this P8 thing. I think we just need to revisit every aspect of sprints. Fair. Period. You are, you are, you are not <laughs> wrong. hundred um, percent. See Qatar 2023 on why we hate sprints. Oh my God. <laughs> um okay so poll for the actual race on sunday was max we both picked max we did get that the podium for the race was max lando checo i was um, close you had you had max carlos checo i had max checo carlos um p10 was hulk which we both got yeah which was exciting um many many funs there and then for biggest surprise, Catherine said that Williams is going to survive the weekend with two intact cars. And they did. They did. Go to Pleasant surprise. And I said that, yes. And I said that Zhou Guan Yu was going to have a good home race, a uh, good first home race. And I would say that he did. Like, he definitely did well in the sprint. I think it was a good, you know, a good showing for him. He didn't DNF. He didn't have anything wildly go wrong. Um, so I, I agree. I, and I, they gave the, the crowd a little bit of excitement when he went after Magnuson at the end of the race for whatever position that was, that doesn't actually matter, but was still like a really fun moment that the crowd just totally ate up. So it was like, yeah, that worked. And see if they had points all the way down to P20, that would be even. And Sauber would have a point at this point. Oh God. Um, and then for who's going to do a dumb, you said Lance and Aston Martin, you hit the nail on the head with this one. Um, great, great call. And I said Alpine. Um, I, I mean, maybe give me credit, maybe don't. They did both make it to Q2 for the race, but they still just look very mediocre. Yeah, and I think, and maybe this was, was last race, but didn't Gasly hit Akon at one point this weekend? I think that's every race. I mean, also, yes. Um, and I, I can't imagine how, how the discussion went of, of Esteban is getting upgrades. Pierre, you are not getting upgrades this week. Um, so I'm sure that went over really well. Real well, because, you know, they're such great friends and, and you know, really love that, ex, you know, part of the, the their teammate experience. Um, but points wise, um, we, we both had a decent haul this weekend. You have seven points. I have 16. Um, so the, we are, we are keeping moving and we'll we'll see how things go uh next race in in miami um because miami is also it only takes one weekend. race for me to turn things around exactly exactly, exactly. if you you had one weekend where you called everything and that's the only reason why you're so far ahead yeah so so, so there's you're still in it plenty of opportunities especially since you know for better in, in miami i i miami the sprint might actually help because miami is kind of a downer race in general so yeah. maybe this will be less bad I, I still I think I still think that the biggest problem is that you either have a good sprint and a shitty GP or you have a shitty sprint and a good GP um and I unless don't max unless you're max and you win by <laughs> each race by 13 seconds so I just I don't think that the sprint race is the answer to F1's problems I you know Crofty said during um the sprint shootout sprint qualifying like would you have you know rather have this or would you rather have FP2 and I'm like but that's that's not really the point is is yeah. not you know FP2 is boring it's 
the the overall weekend is still not great. Well, like if you look at China, like this can kind of roll into our final thoughts. There's four people who have never raced here and everyone else hasn't raced here in five years. You get one free practice and then you're qualifying. Yeah. Like that's crazy. Yeah. And I know that it's, it's not like, it's not necessarily like, oh, they don't need to have two whole hours of preparation before we start racing. Um, but my, it still just goes back to the fact that the sprint race is irrelevant because it doesn't set the grid anymore. Right. That's that. Okay. That's really that's really all that I can go back to is at the very least when the sprint was setting the grid, it meant something. Now it just yeah. doesn't mean anything. I mean, you get points, but again, why it would be good to have like a sprint championship, maybe have more sprints and there's something there. I don't know. Kevin, I'm very confident that we can solve the sprint crisis, though. We'll we'll, we'll keep we'll, talking we'll through it and we'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah we'll just keep spitballing um but yeah so overall final thoughts for me I think China was a, a good race I'm glad that we're back racing um glad my conspiracy theory was proven false um happy to be back it was exciting I yeah and, and like I said I really like like the track itself I think is great I just don't think it should be a sprint weekend I I think that the track is too long to be a sprint yeah, weekend fair. That's fair. the The better sprints are on the shorter, yeah. on so, the shorter track. And, and this is this is a long track with a very long straight. No, it is for sure. Um, that brings us to our F one fun fact. So, what is your F one fun fact for us today, Catherine? Yeah. So, I already mentioned that Red Bull now has a hundred pole positions in their history as as a team. Um, but my question was, how many drivers have actually you know contributed to those hundred poles? And the answer is only five which I think is, oh. yeah, five, five Red Bulls have taken pole position in the history of Red Bull being a team. Sebastian Vettel's done it 44 times. Max yes. has obviously done it 37 times. And then you've got Mark Weber who did it 13 times. And then Sergio Perez and Danny Ricardo have had three poles with Red Bull each. Oh, I forget about Danny. Yeah. And Weber. Yeah. Oh. Interesting. Yeah, so I, I was I was very curious about that because I, I saw a graphic with all five of them. I was like, is it really just the five of them? But well, you have to remember, Red Bull's not that big right. Of a team. Yeah, I like you think, oh, Red Bull and all of its glory, it's a, a historic team, but it's really not. Like, yes, it's historic in the fact that they've done a lot, but they haven't been around. Forever, they like, they didn't Ferrari. show up on the grid until I I was fifteen when Red Bull joined Formula One. Like, yeah, it was a long time ago, that. but like not that long in the grand scheme of Formula One, which has existed in, since 1950. Yeah. Wild. Mm -hmm. Time is so weird. Time. Oh, don't even get me started. Um, all right. Well, coming up next, Catherine and I are going to do another from the DM. So we consistently talk every single day about how silly season is no longer silly season. It's the you know, just in August, it is the full silly season of 2024. Who's going where, what we think, what we want to see, what we don't want to see. So we're just going to do a full silly season, silly speculation episode, which will come out next week on our off week. But that has been it for our Chinese Grand Prix recap. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>